There seems to be a, a, some technical issues with today's recording or today's uh, meeting. And uh, if people join us, that'll be great. If not, you'll just see me talking all by myself, completely lonely and feeling lone, lost and discarded. But we'll do the best we can. I hope you guys had a wonderful Halloween. My family, we went and did the haunted chairlift ride up at Sundance and that was an awful lot of fun. And then the next day we carved pumpkins in the afternoon and had tacos. So that was super. I hope you guys had a wonderful Halloween. I hope everybody was safe and happy. And I hope that your costumes were looked really good. Unless, of course, you elected to decide and grow up and not do the trick-or-treating thing. I think my wife had maybe a dozen trick-or-treaters at most come by. And, they, and she had them each take huge handfuls of candy. So I imagine for the next couple of months, there's going to be some angry parents in the neighborhood. But who cares? It's Halloween. Kids deserve to get sick and eat as much candy as they want. Uh, this last week, I've gotten a couple emails about uh, due dates and wanting some help, um, flexibility with the assignments. And I wanted to reiterate to everybody that the due dates primarily are there to help you as you continue through the course. Unless you, you know, if you talk to me and stuff and just let me know, hey, I'm ca I can't do this, that's fine. Um, by that time, that's fine. I just, I want to make sure that you guys are um, aware that the course is moving forward. And if you have to turn in things a little bit late, that is perfectly fine. I think everybody that has, and I, there's even been several people who have redone assignments and turned them in, and that, that is absolutely great. You guys are taking online classes because you have real world lives, and I, and I understand that. <clears throat> if one week is really crazy and you can't get all the materials or supplies for a project, work on other stuff instead until you can get the materials and then work on that when you can. So it's not going to be that big of a deal. Now, this week, I wanted to talk about two things specifically. This module 11 is kind of a weird one. There's um, a project for you to do. And then there are um, two reflection things to write. And um, the only restriction on the, the reflections is they need to be about 125 words or longer, each one. And uh, how you divide that up is totally fine. How you answer the question is totally fine. I just need them to be well written, good spelling, and in paragraphs of two to five sentences each. And you know, as long as you maintain the standards of writing that you learned um, in high school and the beginning of college, then that'll be just fine. Most of you, one thing that I appreciate is that most of you usually write longer than the minimum required because you want to get the idea out. And that's that's exactly the way it should be. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that ideas are like little fish. I think it was for, um, Earl Nightingale, Nightingale who said that. Ideas are like little fish. We don't stab them with the point of our pen and write them down. They leave forever. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, I wanted to talk a little bit about texture. I want to cover a census walk. We want a list of couple dozen textures. And then I want to talk about the texture cube. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what connection means, the role of art history. Mention one of my heroes, Ibn Khaldun. And uh, we'll talk, uh, just briefly mention connection as it relates to art movements. Because next week we're going to be dealing more with um, art history uh, sp in specific areas of the world and talk about things like that. You've had a little bit of an intro introduction to that with the uh, art of the old Mali kingdom and or Mali empire and some of these more contemporary artists. But I think now you can, you'll generate something of a vocabulary so you can tell are these artists that we're looking at from today are, are some of them in one movement or another or some of them more impressionist? Do some of them do 
uh, monolithic work? Do some of them do uh, more impressionist work? And uh, we'll be able to um, add that vocabulary to your uh, critical thinking skills as we apply the tools of our artistic critique to the things that we're seeing and learning about. First, texture. A lot of the times we'll group textures into two categories. One is visual, one is physical. These are not mutually exclusive. Most of the textures you interact with are going to be both physical and visual. There's not gonna be an awful lot of exceptions. When you play a video game, the textures that you see on the screen, those are all completely visual. <coughs> Excuse me, because even though they mimic physical textures, they're on a two dimensional screen and you can only see them. A lot of physical textures that you encounter also become visual. Like for example, if you are lucky enough to live in an apartment that has one of those lovely popcorn ceilings, not only is that a physical texture, but the way it plays with the shadow from your um, low wattage lamp, it uh, does some really interesting things visually as well. Or you'll see if somebody has like a herringbone corduroy or uh, that they're wearing, or sometimes you'll see somebody wearing uh, other materials that are very, have very strong physical texture and the shadows that are appearing in the physical and highlights in the physical texture make a very um, intriguing visual texture as well. What's the difference between physical and vis visual? How do you primarily experience visual texture with your eyes? And physical texture, you can primarily experience physical texture with your senses of touch. But most of the time when we engage with a physical texture, our initial encounter is through our sense of vision. So that's why I say it's also a visual texture. <coughs> Can you think of examples? Just in your head, think of examples where a texture was entirely visual or a texture was entirely physical. I think it's we don't encounter entirely physical textures very often because most of the time, like I said, our initial uh, interaction with it is through our sense of sight. A friend of mine made an art exhibit for the visually impaired. In that exhibit, he did some bronze castings with different textures and hid them inside of a bag so that view sighted people could go through the exhibit put their hands in the bag and, ex and experience something similar to what the visually impaired uh, patrons were experiencing because they could only feel the texture. It was almost, it was entirely physical. I wanted to mention a census walk. A census walk is a really good routine to do to counteract extra stress. What it does is it engages your senses and it heightens your awareness of your senses and what you're experiencing so that the stresses and tensions that you feel uh, fall to the background. But the primary reason we are using a census walk for this uh, bit on texture is that we can really focus in on the textures that are all around us that we encounter every day. Now, why I should have mentioned the texture for this module, it refers to the seventh of those seven elements of art. They were line, shape, <coughs> space, form, uh, shading, color, and then uh, texture. So it's the seventh out of the seven. During your senses walk, what you're gonna do is look as closely as you can to the things around you and feel as much as you are comfortable touching. Because you're trying to explore what you encounter with your senses as much as possible. When you go on this walk, and it should only take about 15 minutes to go on this walk, bring with you little bags that you can collect textures in. And uh, for example, um, some of the birds that you see on plants are really good textures, but you have to be careful if you gather them because they can really hurt. 
but also uh, grass and leaves are good textures. Dead bark, dead twigs, all that kind of stuff is really good. Make sure before you collect it that you have permission and that it's not from anything living. Excuse me for a sec. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm really glad, by the way, that we're doing this via video because I would hate to cough in the face of any of you guys. And I want to list 25 textures. And Alex, if you're in a position where you can chime in, please um, add your two, three, or four cents worth as well. But some textures are smooth, rough, uh, hairy, furry, slimy, slippery. Let's see, uh, smooth. Oh, I already said smooth. Rubbery, plasticky, and sticky. Sticky is a really good one. I don't know what you would call it, but the like if you have a stack of paper. That kind of weird texture that's on the edge of the stack of paper where all the edges of the paper come up to it. I don't know what you would call that. We've got to give that a name. Um, plasticky is one, but there's a kind of plastic that's like the, the plastic wrap, like saran wrap. But there's also the kind of plastic that you see when people wrap presents. It's kind of the, the crinkly plastic. That's kind of a cool texture too. I like the texture from bubble wrap. <coughs> if you spray bubble wrap with different layers of spray paint and move it a little bit as the paint is drying on each layer, it gives you a really incredible visual texture too. I'm sorry that you had to see me drink my strawberry flavored coconut milk without sharing. I don't know if I could share it with you. But if I could, rest easy knowing that I won't. I like it too much. Now, foil is a really has some really interesting textures. You can crinkle it up and smooth it out. So you have that crinkly fo re uh, reflective texture. You can smooth it, keep it really smooth. So you have the very reflective texture. And then you can put a different texture underneath it and kind of smooth it down over that texture. So foil can be reflective, it can be bumpy, it can be crinkly. It can be all those things. I'm thinking of um, mildew can have a really gross texture. I, I really like hiking and lichen has a very cool texture to it. Basalt, the raw rock of basalt has some very neat texture to it. Sandstone, cement, if it's smoothed or textured, it has very different texture, uh, textures to it. Broken cement, the, when you make rubbings on um, uh, headstone markers or grave markers, that can really give you an interesting texture. The kind of creosote-soaked wood that you see on old telephone poles has a very interesting texture to it. Uh, have you ever been in a showroom or on a lot with used cars and accidentally scraped your fingernail on old car paint? It has kind of a, an enamely chalky texture that's just really disgusting feeling if you accidentally scratch it. But chalky is a good texture. Uh, milky, I, I guess, would be more of a visual texture. Greasy is a good one. Snotty. Mucousy. Mucilaginous. Uh, oily. Waxy. I don't know why all of a sudden I started thinking about ears, but there you go. Um, I, we already said furry, but I'm also thinking leathery, uh, hide, like a pelt. Um, you know, that really grow. If have you ever had a dog that just found some fresh cow pies and thought it would be a great idea to just roll at them? Is you get that kind of wet dog fur feel. And then it has this thing that's almost like an adobe crust to it. And that is super disgusting, but very visually interesting. Adobe is a cool texture. If you're doing wattle and daub uh, architecture or building, that has a very cool texture, depending on how you create the adobe. Sometimes you put hair in it, sometimes you put straw in it. Each of those has a very distinctive texture. <coughs> Old wood, 
like uh, barn wood, barn door wood that has been in the desert for years has a distinctive texture to it that's very different than driftwood. One has been uh, texturized because of basically sandblasting and the other one just because of water wearing uh, it away. The edges of leaves are fascinating. The edges of feathers, torn cloth, cut cloth, both of those have very fascinating textures to them. Denim, satin, cotton, canvas, velvet, um, tweed, wool. So what, what I've been doing is just thinking of different materials or different situations I've been in or different things around me and just describing the textures that I see on them. So in the, in the module, I mean, in the quiz for this module, you'll be asked to list 12 textures. The easiest way to do that is to just look at your environment and just see the textures that are around you and describe them. So I think we, see now Alex and me, we listed at least 30 of them. And so those, those are really good. So for your texture cube, what you need to do is make six tiles out of cardboard that are each four inches by four inches, and then spend 45 minutes on each one, giving them the texture. I say 45 minutes because you can do this in three minutes and it looks like crap. But if you do it in 45 minutes then you'll do what's obvious and then you'll think beyond what's obvious and you keep laying, layering things on. <coughs> one fascinating thing that people can do that I have not seen yet is have, have you ever used the two part um, resin or a boxy for casting? One thing that's really cool is to make small, very small batches of that, put a layer on the car, you know, build a dam around it with duct tape. So the duct tape, the sticky side is facing in and, and the sides go straight up on each of the four tile sides. Paint a very thin layer of that epoxy resin on the cardboard and when it dries, use something like a magic marker or a whiteout pen and draw a texture on it. When that dries, pour a little bit more epoxy and then draw something with a marker. And then when that dries, put another layer of epoxy and build that up. I've seen artwork done like this where people will get like a quarter inch layer, um, quarter inch thick layers of the epoxy resin, but because they drew between each one, it has an unreal amount of depth to it. <coughs> so that's one texture you could do. If you collect feathers or leaves, think about cluing them on the side or on the end. A lot of people just lay them flat on the, the tile. If you stand them up and then you kind of have them in rows smashed up against each other, then the texture becomes the edge of the feather or the edge of the leaf. And that is infinitely more fascinating. Uh, little pebbles, you can put glue pebbles on with something like Elmer's glue that dries clear. Once that's dry, Put another layer on that and then another layer on that and build it up like that that can be really cool or just the same thing with yarn that you've cut into tiny uh you know half inch lengths or something if you're going to use something like cheerios or anything like that instead of gluing it so you just see the round circles break them in half and glue the the halves down so that they bump towards you so you get this weird ribbony effect instead of the typical donut <coughs> You can also cut into the cardboard and peel some of the cardboard back. One of the artists that I have you look at for this module, that's one of the things that they do. Uh, they'll peel the cardboard back and get different textures so that you can see the edge of the cardboard. Or maybe your design on the cube or uh, on the particular face that you're working on, you cut a lot of half inch strips from another cardboard box and turn them on the side so you see the zigzag corrugation. And then you make a design with that zigzag corrugation on the tile that you're building. One thing that I've done before is getting several squares that are four inches by four inches, cutting different designs out of each one. So I just have a bit of, bit of a quarter inch line defining the design that is left in each of the pieces of cardboard and then stack them on top of each other. And then you can get this kind of 3D tunneling effect as you look at it and the design looks very interesting. And if you go back afterwards and mark that inside up with a Sharpie so that it, it's uh, black inside, 
that really makes it very interesting. Louise Nevelson would paint a lot of her sculptures monochromatically with black or white or gray or tin because she really liked seeing how the light affected that so you weren't confused by the elements of the natural, the visual elements of the natural wood. So all those are really good things to think about and explore this. And uh, some of the most interesting things I've seen is somebody who would will spend 10 or 15 minutes, think they're all done, and then realize, oh, I've got a half an hour left. And then they just start uh, brain spasming, coming up with ideas <clears throat> and just trying everything they can think of. And that ends up looking really cool. I also included a really short video to show you how to put these tiles together so you can make a cube. If you have a hard time and you just can't get it to work, just line them up with uh, three columns of two each so that all six of the squares are next to each other and take a photo of that. But I think these look really cool when you can do them as cubes. <clears throat> Alex, do you have any other questions about the texture cube? No, I don't think so. Sounds okay. pretty straightforward. All right, great. The next thing I want to talk about is art history and art movements. I have several um, videos for you to watch. The videos all together take about a um, little bit over an hour to watch, but they are really important. And the reason why we're doing videos right now is because I want you to have a baseline of vocabulary so we can talk more about this next week and as we move forward as well. <coughs> Keep in mind, the principles that you learned as we were addressing the four tools of artistic critique, which are description, analyzation, interpretation, and evaluation. Now, one of the videos that I have is, um, it's called uh, Close Looking. And that's one of the first videos, and it's only a couple minutes long. But uh, what it gets you to do is look at this from a slightly different perspective than the four tools of artistic critique even though those four tools are still in there. The biggest difference is that they have you actually look at the thing with concentration for at least five minutes. And I think that's, that's a really good thing um, to, in order to appreciate art, excuse me, in general, it should be, you should allow time for it to soak in. Even if you feel slightly nauseated, you know, do what you can to give it a fair shake because sometimes even that process of looking at it for longer than 30 seconds helps our brain to adjust to it and helps us to understand what's going on, or at least appreciate what's going on a little bit more. Appreciating the, the craftsmanship, for example, or appreciating the materials that were used. So, you know, look at that uh, video and then and look at the other ones. So you can kind of see, get an overview of first what art history means. And then next, how art history is developed through art movements or understood through art movements. <coughs> One of the things I mentioned in this throughout is connection and context. Those are, well, two things, connection and context. Everything is built from context. That's how we understand things. An object or an art object has a context as the structure itself, has a context within the, the society or atmosphere in which it was created, how it was created, how it was built, the materials used, um, what it may mean for that society, but it also has a context in a broader scheme of things as we look at it from outsiders or insiders to the culture that produced it. So there's these three layers of context that we can see. <clears throat> Ibn Khaldun was a 14th century Muslim philosopher who is the father of what we call today museology. He also defined a lot of the scientific um, principles that go into the formation of things like the soft sciences, like sociology and history. He was one of the first people to really clearly articulate the meta thinking behind these kinds of soft sciences. One of the things that he pointed out was that when we display something, we remove it from its original context. Now I mentioned that there's three levels of context and I want you to think about this for just a second. There's at least three levels of context. There's a lot more, but there's at least three. 
if Alex were to go into a museum and see a 200 year old flute on display, right? Looking at that flute, first thing he's gonna do is say to himself, you know, Professor Kostrock told me that I really need to be smart and use the four tools of artistic critique. So that's what I'm gonna do. And he'll apply his critical thinking skills and everybody around him will just think he's amazing. The second thing he'll do is looking at that and realize there's at least three layers of context here. The first layer is whoever made that flute created it as a means of their livelihood. It was a tool and it was a product that was made. So it's an artistic piece, it's an artifact, but it was a thing that was made by a human being. And that human being put their experience, their personal history, their own layers of meaning into that thing when they made it. So that's one layer of context. Second layer of context is whoever used that flute used it as an instrument. And it changed the lives of people who heard it. It probably changed the lives of the person, the people that played it over time as well. So that's a different layer of context. And in the larger society that the flute was, was uh, created to be within, or the larger society and atmosphere that the flute lived in is another way of looking at it. And then what's the third context? Well, it's on a pedestal in a museum so we can hopefully see how cool it is and maybe appreciate those other layers of context. But now, Ibn Khaldun said, it's on display. It's a completely different object. It may be the same physical thing, but is it being constructed as an instrument? No. Is it being used as an instrument? No. Is it being used as a status symbol? Maybe flautists in that society 200 years ago were important people. Well, no, it's not. What it's used is being used for is a point of academic curiosity for whoever comes into the museum. So you, can you see how it's a completely different kind of context, but the, even though the object is the same physical thing, the meanings of the object completely change with how we view the context of the object. And art history deals with that idea directly in relation to the art objects that are made or the art performances that are performed. So think about that as you go through and um, watch the videos on uh, how do we can appreciate and understand art history. One of the reasons I like Ibn Khaldun is he was very poetic and he described history as living in a river of ghosts. So can you, have any, you've walked, I'm sorry, have you ever walked into a river before and felt the water flowing around you? Yeah, think about that, how the water impacts you and how you in turn make ripples in the water. And Ibn Khaldun suggested, think of that water as the ghosts of everybody that has come to the earth before you. On some, you know, there's going to be lots of ghosts that are over by the shore that may not connect with you directly. But for, for the most part, what you are living within right now is the momentum and the after effects of the experiences of all the hundreds of billions of people that have lived in the earth before. You know, and they're, they're ghosts. And in this context, ghost is not necessarily something related to Halloween, but it has everything to do with the effects and the memories of those people. People that we don't even know the names of have impacted us in ways that we can't even imagine. One of the reasons that we have shielded cables is that an unknown telegraph operator recognized that in the mid 19th century, a solar flare took out the nation's telegraph system and melted all the copper wire. Did you know that? That's an example of a direct impact of a ghost of somebody that we never even knew had existed. And we can see that all the time, but in turn, your ghost affects everybody both present, well, present in the future, obviously, and in the past as well, because your particular perspective, how you interacted with history also affects how the people you know and interact with, how they interact with history. And everything that you do has ripples that will go through everything around you right now, but off into the future as well, both in your own life and those of, um, around you. And in five, 10 years, people you don't even know as well. So I, I like that 
idea of history and existence being a river of ghosts that we live within. I think that's kind of cool. But uh, we can really see the connections and how things are related and those questions of context as we look at different art movements. And I've given you a couple different videos. I think the longest one is a little bit over 20 minutes and the shortest one is about three. That are just different views of the main, several of the main art movements that we're familiar with in the West. These are things like Dadaism, minimalism, um, pointillism, splash painting, modernism, postmodernism, uh, hyperrealism. A lot of these are um, hypersymbolism. The symbolist painters included people like uh, Lord Byron, who was a favorite of Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. She loved him so much that uh, she based a lot of what she did on his writings. And uh, she loved the romance behind Lord Byron. <clears throat> but uh, there's several different movements and it's almost it's almost impossible to identify all of them because there are so many, but uh, those videos talk a little bit how about how they've connected. It describes a little bit of the context behind each of them. So we'll talk more about that next week. And then you have two reflections to write uh, that are just helping you to kind of articulate your responses to what you're learning about um, how to view art history and about art movements and as we move forward. Do you have any questions or anything, Alex? No. Okay. Any questions you think any students might have? Um, is there like a particular place you would want to walk or just kind of anywhere you can find? That's an excellent question because I think it should be anywhere you can get to first in anywhere that you think, <coughs> excuse me, in anything, anywhere that you think <coughs> might have interesting textures. So, you know, either one of those two things. Like if you know of a park space, like there's a park up on the hill above uh, the St. George Tabernacle that has a lot of like um, dead weeds and a lot of dead branches and things. And that might be a fun place to go to. But if you can't make it to a park, maybe you're on a soccer tour or something with a soccer team this week, then do a walk around the area, that, uh, the apartments that you're living in. You know, that's fine too. But, um, and I would even suggest doing a couple of these, but they should be about, I would, I would say at least 15 minutes long, you know, try for 15 minutes. And if you want to drive out into the hinterlands, like to um, Snow Canyon or uh, Pine Valley, and walk around there, that, that is perfectly fine as well. That's an excellent question. All right, if there's nothing else, then that's good for me. Is that good for you? All right. Good for All me. Right, well, thank you, sir. We will see you thank later. Yeah. Okay, see ya. See ya.